Welcome to this talk. My name is Matthew Cornford. I'm a head of product at Ocado Technology. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about how we orchestrate massive robot swarms using Java. At Ocado Technology, we're developing what we call the Ocado Smart Platform, or OSP. And this is the most advanced logistics and fulfillment platform in the world. We are providing the technology and logistics which enables global grocery retailers to take their business online. And this platform spans everything from web shop, fulfillment sites, and robotics that I'm going to show you today. We have nine major grocery players around the world using currently. And as you can see, we even have Catalonia's very own Bon Preu using the Ocado Smart Platform. Not only do we have retailers around the world using this uh, grocery e-commerce platform, but we also have development centers dotted around the world, including in Barcelona itself. We opened our Barcelona development center in 2016 to tap into the talents, the city's local tech talent, and we've been growing that office ever since. We've got currently over 170 employees and 30 national and we expect to grow it to more than 200 by the end of this year. To support this growth, we've recently moved into a brand new building in Barcelona in the city's innovation district at 22 at Hub. Our team in Barcelona specializes in our e-commerce end of OSP, the software which we think gives the best digital consumer experience for consumers buying their groceries online. And we've got product managers, engineers, data scientists, UX researchers, and designers all working to make this best consumer experience. But I'm here to talk to you about robots and how we use Java to orchestrate these massive robot swarms. And what better way to start than by showing you a video. As you can see in this video, there are a lot of robots here. And they are running on what we call the hive. Everything you see in this video was developed by us at Cardo The hardware, the software, the structure they run on, everything. And there are even things unseen that we have developed here. A proprietary 4G based wireless network a protocol communicating with the robots at 10 times a second. An air traffic light controls an air traffic light control system orchestrating this entire robot swarm, warehouse management system software, and much more. And it's the air traffic management light control system, which we develop in Java, which I'm gonna to talk to you about today. So I'm gonna to start to talk about simulation and determinism. And I'm going to say two crucial principles behind how we develop and optimize our control systems. Once I've given an introduction into what simulation is and why we are this, I'll move on to talk about some of the optimizations we've had to make as part of developing our control system. And hopefully by explaining some of those opt optimizations, you'll see why simulation and determinism is so important for us. So let's start by defining what simulation is. Simulation is an approximate imitation of an operation of a process or system. The act of simulating first requires a model is developed. This is the first line from the Wikipedia definition. I'm not gonna pretend to have made this myself, but I think it captures it quite well. And if you're still not really getting what a simulation is by that definition, well, here are two classic examples if you're old enough to ever play these games. These games are probably showing you a little bit of my age. Um, that that's Microsoft Flight Simulator, obviously simulating the process of flying an airplane, and The Sims, which is simulating being a human being in the real world. Hopefully you can see that these are approximate imitations of what they are trying to convey, and they're approximating a process or a system. For the flight simulator case in particular, the model developed might be the physics model, which allows the plane to exhibit movements in the game, which re look really realistic about how the plane would move in real life. And future versions of Microsoft Flight Simulator have improved on that model, improved its granularity, improved its fidelity, so that the plane looks ever more realistic, but it's only ever still a model. 
So why do we use a simulation at Apollo? Well, it's because we operate in the physical world and that involves hardware and people. By having the ability to test solely in the digital world, which SIM allows us to do, we can do our testing and our research much quicker and much more cheaply than if we had to do it in the real world. And we use simulation to do some of the following things. We validate our warehouse designs our, our as we be. We evaluate algorithmic improvements to see if they really will give us the uh, improvements we expect. We use simulation to speed up our development cycles. This simulation allows us to decouple our hardware and software development. It also allows us to inject errors into places where it would be really hard to observe those errors in real life. And it allows us to evaluate the performance of a warehouse as it will be many years into the future without actually having to build that warehouse and staff it and fill it up with all the hardware that we expect to put in there. But as usual, there are also some disadvantages to, to everything. And simulation is just an approximation. As we went back in the definition, we said a model has to be a developed. And a model is never really going to match the real world in all the same detail. And so we have to be very clear about where we're making what approximations in our simulations uh, and just how much we can rely on it and where it falls down. We also have to keep our simulations in sync with the real thing. And that provides an ongoing uh, support and maintenance burden, but one we think is definitely worth bearing for the benefits we get. So what are some of the things we simulate uh, in our system? Well, if green here is the real world and we've got our real Java control system, remember I said this is an air traffic-like control system, which is controlling thousands of robots, communicating with them 10 times a second. Obviously, in the, our real production environment, there will be many other systems uh, that this will be talking to, many software systems. And in our simulation environment, we would simulate those software systems. These aren't mocks or stubs, but these are often simplified re-implementations of the software systems themselves. This allows us to decouple our testing from other software teams in Ocado so that we can make progress without having to run the entire production environment to do our testing. We might simulate our hardware. In fact, we have a simulated version of the robot running around on our grid. And as per the definition, we've had to construct a model about how that bot operates in the real world how it moves, how it op operates, and its performance characteristics. And lastly, we also have simulated people. Our job control system is reliant on people performing actions in the warehouse, and we model those actions in our simulations. We model how long someone might take to perform an action, maybe by timing how long they do it in the real world and producing a st statistical distribution, and then using that distribution in our simulated environment to get a good representation of how that person might operate in the real world. We use a very specific type of simulation uh, here at Cardio Technology, one called discrete event simulation. And again, here's the first line of the Wikipedia article uh, page about what discrete events, event simulation is. A discrete event simulation models the operation of a system as a discrete sequence of events in time. Each event occurs at a particular instance in time and marks a change of state in system. Between consecutive events, no change in the system is assumed to occur. Thus, the simulation can jump in time from one event to the next. There's some really important points here, which I'm going to come back to later. But in order for us to build our software to use discrete event simulation, we had to make some really explicit design choices up front. And most notably that is that our application state will only change as a result of an event. As it says here, we assume that no system changes, no system state changes just through the passing of time, regardless how much time that is. And so here kind of is a graphical example of how a discrete event simulation might work and how it allows us to run our simulations faster than if we were just using a real-time simulation. So let's imagine we have the first event which enters our system at time t0. That event will take some amount of time to process. M most of the time, that processing time is less than what it takes for the next event to come in. So the second event comes in at time t1. If we were running this in real time, we would have to wait 
T1 minus T0 seconds for that event to come in. However, in our discrete event simulation, as per the definition, we're able to jump straight to T1 and inject that event and start processing it again. And the event might come in at time T2, that will take some variable amount of time to process. And as we play along the events and we record all the processing, what we often see is that the sum of the processing time is actually a lot shorter than the time period in which the events came in. What this means is discrete event, event simulations usually allow us to run hours, if not days, of real-time events in a much shorter period of time. Like I said, one of the advantages of, this, of simulation for us was incre increasing our developer iteration time. And this is precisely how we can achieve that. So in order to build in determinism into our system, uh, we had to recognize that real-time systems themselves are not deterministic. And we really want determinism in our discrete event simulations. We use our, simu our developers use discrete event simulations on their desktops to run tests, to run scenarios, to understand how their software is working. And you really want a deterministic unit test or scenario test so that you can run it again and again and again and be sure you get the same results. And so we've had to reconcile this fact that real-time systems are not deterministic uh, with the fact that we really want determinism. And to make sure we have a determinism, you know, it's that important to us that we test for it in our continuous integration pipelines. Now, you can't prove that your software is deterministic, but in our experience, if you run something enough times, non-deterministic behavior will very quickly uh, show its face. And so we think we get a good, uh, a good confidence by running uh, this in our CI pipeline that our software is uh, as deterministic as it can be. But to help us write deterministic discrete event simulations, we had to build our own library, uh, one we call a Carver, and one we've open sourced onto GitHub recently. You've got the link there, you can go and check it out for yourselves. I'm gonna actually just show you a few very simplified examples now, some of the code uh, in a Carver to show you how we've dealt with some of the aspects about real-time systems which are not deterministic. The first one of those is time. And this is a really simple example, uh, just applying really basic Java principles of having interfaces uh, and different implementations. But rather than relying on system calls to get the time, we have had to abstract the notion of a time provider. As you can see, it has a simple method, get time. What this means is that in our discrete event environment, on our developer's desktops or in our tests, we're able to run our uh, software with an implementation which we might call adjustable time provider. This allows us to get the time, obviously, as per the interface, but also provides an additional method for us to set the time, giving us control in our tests to move time along. And you'll see how that's used in a minute when I show you some code which demonstrates the uh, discrete event simulation processing of events. And similarly, when we want to run uh, our code in production, we provide a different implementation which would just return the normal system time as you would get from the Java libraries. Now, we also have a check style rule which blocks direct calls to this system.currentTime millis, which makes sure that we are controlling time in all uh, areas of our code. Another area of our code which is often a source of non-determinism, is scheduling of events. And again, we don't use the standard Java executor or Jet executor service when doing this in our simulation environment. Instead, as before, we've introduced our own interface, or in this case, interfaces, event and event scheduler, which allow us to control the implementation of scheduling that we have in our discrete event simulation versus the one we have in our production code. So here is uh, our, a very simplified version of our discrete event scheduler. Hopefully when you read through this, and I'll leave it up on the screen for a minute or so, you'll see that this is executing exactly that sequence of events that I showed you in that diagram earlier. We have a continuous while loop. As, as long as we have some events, we're gonna carry on processing. Before we process the event, we're using our adjustable time provider to set the time. Precisely as we had in that Wikipedia definition, we're giving ourselves the ability here to jump 
uh, forward in time, which gives allows our dissimulations to run faster than they would in the real world. We would then process the event with the dot run call on our event, and then we would get the next event and go round again. Uh, and we would repeat and repeat and repeat until we run out of events to process. So that's a little bit about simulation and determinism. I'm now going to talk about some of the ways we have optimized our control system to meet the really low latent and high throughput requirements that such a system has when orchestrating a large uh, number of robots in real time. I want to start with this uh, kind of well-known quote from Donald Knuth that premature optimization is the root of all evil. Uh, and I really believe that is the case. You, know, you should only optimize your code in the most critical or sensitive places where you absolutely need to. And I think it's useful to help putting that quote in the wider context or, or the wider uh, quote from Donald, and that's, we should forget about small efficiencies, say 97% of the time. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Yet we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%. And I really want to stress that some of the stuff I'm going to show you now, I would say, is really in that critical 3 of code that absolutely has to be uh, optimized. And you know, often what we're doing, we're giving up some of the standard practices or things we would normally do, maybe giving up some readability or giving up some, some simplicity in order to get that, uh, that optimization. And again, we don't do this everywhere, but we do it in that most critical 3%. And obviously, we have our simulation and our deterministic simulation to help us test that our optimizations are actually doing what we expect. So let's go back to event scheduling. I didn't show you our real-time implementation of our event scheduler earlier, so I want to show you that now. Yes, I said, our, in our hive system, we have our control system talking to our robots 10 times a second. So we have a real low latent requirement for our control system to be able to process hundreds uh, of, th of thousands of events uh, in any one second and get responses back to the robots to keep them moving. And so we have quite strict requirements on our event scheduler. We have to be able to schedule our events for very specific times in the future. And we, we can't have individual events be arbitrarily delayed. We can't have them run 10 milliseconds later or 20 milliseconds later than when we schedule them. That's just not acceptable for us. And we can't allow events to back up either. Otherwise, our robots would run out of work and everything would grind to a standstill. So if you were looking to the standard Java libraries to solve this problem, you might automatically think of a class like Scheduled Threadpool Executor. And in fact, when we started writing our control system, this is exactly what we did for our real-time uh, implementation of our event scheduler. And if we go back to our three requirements, I'll, I'll talk through a little bit now about how the scheduled thread for executor works and why you'll see it doesn't actually meet all of our requirements here. Well, the first requirement is quite a basic one, really. The event scheduler thread for executor provides an API that allows you to provide a time to schedule event. So we definitely need that one. But what happens when an event is ready to be get executed? Well, depending on the parameters set for the thread pool size, say, the scheduler might uh, decide to create a new thread. Now, thread creation takes time, and hence we might incur some arbitrary delay. So clearly, this uh, class doesn't meet our second requirement. And how about our third requirement? Well. You may not know, but the uh, scheduled thread pool executor, the last time I checked, maintains an infinite queue of events. And so actually events, if you're not processing them quick enough, can back up and back up and back up without the class ever throwing any sort of exception or let, if, unless you check explicitly uh, about that queue getting bigger and bigger. So again, that requirement is uh, really not met for us. So what did we do to uh, optimize this piece of code? Now, event scheduling is a core part of the code for us. Like I said, it's that critical 3%. And we implemented something called a busy loop. Now, a busy loop might not be something that you're familiar with, because actually, if you go and Google uh, busy loop on the internet, you'll often find a device which is uh, telling you not to use a busy loop. And in 
I'd say 99% of cases, uh, that would be the correct advice. But for us, we were w willing to make the sacrifice. We, our requirements were such that uh, the sacrifices that you need to make for using a busy loop actually gave us the benefits we needed. And so what you can see here is uh, a while true loop. So this is a piece of code which is just going to run indefinitely. Uh, and every time that loop, it's seeing what the time is and it's checking whether the time has passed and it's ready to run the next event. That's in the if statement. If the time is ready to run the next event, we will run that event immediately. What we are effectively doing here is dedicating a whole CPU core to running the events with as minimal delay as possible, literally the delay in checking an if call. Uh, and so we implemented this and we did some benchmarking in our simulation environment. And what we saw was that we were actually able to reduce the latency from an individual event down from less about five milliseconds down to effectively zero. Now, I'm not saying you would get this in all software. I'm not saying you should go away and implement a busy loop in your software. But we had simulation, we had discrete event simulation, and one which was deterministic. And so we were allowed, able to run our tests again and again and again, sure that they were doing the same thing to measure how our software would perform. And we were confident that we saw this result and that we would get it in the real world. Our testing also showed that for us, this implementation supported three times higher throughput of events. Getting rid of all those arbitrary delays allowed us more time to actually process the events. Now, some of the disadvantages, uh, I've mentioned this one already, you know, a busy loop uses up 100% CPU utilization. This is often one of the reasons stated why busy loops are a bad thing because you're effectively burning a CPU core and not fully utilizing it. Often you want to optimize for fully utilizing your resources, but we were fully aware of this cost and we were willing to pay it. And there's an interesting side effect that actually, if you run your CPU at 100% for long enough, you can actually physically reduce the clock speed as time goes along. So actually decrade our machines as time go by uh, implementing this code. Another area where we've had to optimize a lot and focus on is garbage collection. And obviously, this comes as part of using uh, the Java environment. And garbage collection is one of our primary sources of stop the world causes, which in a real time system, which is trying to control robots and keep them moving, uh, is really not something you want. So we spent a lot of time profiling our application and finding places where we can reduce the pressure on garbage collection. And often what this means is actually just uh, reducing the amount of objects we create. Again, all the things I'm going to mention here are sort of against standard advice. And I wouldn't recommend you go around your code base just doing this everywhere. But in the places where we've profiled and we've seen either a high garbage collection or the, our code spending a lot of time, we've been able to op add these optimizations and really see a, a performance benefit. Again, testing in our simulation environment. So one of the things we did was remove optionals from our APIs that were heavily used. Optionals are great for signaling uh, to, the, to the developer what the intent is and what could be returned from a function call, but it is a wrapper object and it is creating an unnecessary object. So if you don't need it and you're trying to create really optimal code, then, then best not use it. We've used for loops instead of the streams API. Well, again, the streams API is great for making really readable, understandable code. But often what you'll find is streams create an abundance of objects in order to provide that readability, where for loops use kind of native uh, parts of the language which don't have those objects. And so, you know, in, again, in those critical places where we're running the code lots of times, this is a way we can reduce pressure on our garbage collector. And using array back data structures instead of hash sets or linked lists. Hopefully you're getting the idea now. A lot of this is about reducing the number of objects our code is creating. And here's one which is an interesting one which you might not think of. Avoiding boxing or unboxing of objects, especially in places like uh, debugging and logging. 
One of the other benefits that we could get from both using Java, uh, a great language which provides many garbage collectors, and also having simulations is we were able to compare different garbage collectors to see how that affected the performance of our system. We were running a G1GC garbage collector for a long time in our production environment. And if you're not too familiar with G1GC, it allows you to specify a target pause time. This was great for us in a real-time system as it gave us a little bit of predictability about how our uh, control system would operate. However, you trade it off by having lower throughput and allowing the garbage collector to use a little bit more CPU. When ZGC was introduced in Java 11 as an experimental garbage collector, we got really excited because it made some promises of some really low pause time, less than 10 milliseconds of pause. And so we were keen to see how it would perform uh, in our software. And again, we used our simulations to test this out and compare them. And just to say that ZGC is no longer experimental from Java 15, it's a fully supported garbage collector. So what you're seeing here is a graph of total application pause time. We have uh, pause times on the y-axis and percentiles of pause times on uh, the x-axis. And basically, the lower the line, the better. So you can see here that ZGC, uh, the pauses under ZGC are consistently lower than that in G1GC. Again, great for us in a real-time control system where we're trying to fire out uh, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of messages to those bots every second. And this graph kind of is the same result as shown slightly differently. This is our application throughput, i.e. how much time we're giving over to the garbage collector to do its work. Now, what this correlated to us was G1GC in a 12-hour test using about seven and a half minutes of pause time whereas ZGC was using less than 1.5 minutes of pause time over that same 12-hour test. So that's a whole six extra minutes for our uh, control system to run and process events and actually do some of our processing rather than uh, garbage collection processing. So we, we used this and we implemented ZGC in our production environment after testing it in our simulations, and we've seen uh, great results uh, from it for us. But as I said before, you know, this is not to say that you should go away and use ZGC in, in your systems, but that having for us having a simulation environment where we're able to test our system and test it in a deterministic way and run those tests again and again and again, we were able to get real confidence that this was a benefit for our software uh, and one that we should make. So that's the end of my talk, and I, I want to thank you for sticking with me for the past half an hour. So in summary, uh, what I've talked through today is we orchestrate massive bot swarms with a control system written in Java. And simulations are used extensively by us to test and optimize this control system. We make great effort to ensure that our software is 100% deterministic within our discrete event simulation. And we've used that to extensively optimize parts of our control system to achieve and kind of really low latency and high throughput requirements. And as I said, those optimization often involve doing things which are against the standard practice or advice when writing Java code. So thank you for listening. If I've sparked your interest about what we do at Ocado Technology and you're interested in your next opportunity being in Ocado, then you're in luck because we are hiring in our Barcelona office. If you scan that QR code, that will take you to one of our careers pages. Select Barcelona as the location, and you'll be able to see all the exciting Java jobs we have open in Ocado, Barcelona. Thank you very much again for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of uh, JBCN conference.